People are here. They're showing up. <laughs> cool. All right, we're, we'll give it just a, a second or two for participants to roll into the session. But thank you for coming. This is your Ask an Ambassador Anything live student panel. So you can ask anything about academics, student life, how things are going from home. <laughs> Um, if you have questions to start, you can use the Q&A feature, which is linked at the bottom, that Q&A button. Um, you can start asking questions. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce myself, and then I'm going to turn it over to one of the ambassadors, and then they're going to keep going around just till we're done introducing ourselves. And then we'll take your questions, all right? <clears throat> so welcome, everybody. Um, again, this is the Ask an Ambassador Anything, so I will try and shut up and let the students answer. Um, but I am Mark Von Cannon. I'm Director of Student Recruitment and Career Development for the College of Letters and Science. And I've been on campus almost 20 years. I was a student in the college as a psych major many, many years ago. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Leanne, and then Leanne, do you want to just introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, what your major is, what class level you are, that kind of thing, and then pass it on, okay? Sure. Hi, everyone. Congratulations on your acceptance to Davis. My name is Leanne Taylor, and I am a fourth-year linguistics student from Riverside, California, um, and some things I'm also involved in at Davis are the concert band and the women's rugby team. Uh, I'll hand it over to Zach. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm currently a third year here at Davis. I'm from Torrance, California, which is in good old Southern California. And I'm actually a mathematics and economics double major with also a minor in political science. Um, and I'm also a tour guide on campus, too. And I'll pass it to Metzli. <laughs> Hello, my name is Metzli. I'm a second year physics major at Davis. Congratulations, students. Uh, some things that I'm involved in on campus are I'm part of the radio station as a news reporter. Um, I'm also part of the diversity and physics club as well as um, briefly dabbling in like orchestral and like sports here at Davis. So I'll pass the mic to Priyal. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Priyal, and I'm a second year um, international relations and managerial economics double major with a minor in sociology. Um, I'm from the Bay Area, and another thing that I'm involved in is um, UC Davis uh, mock trial team, and I also work as a research assistant. Um, and I'll pass it on to Itzel. Hi, everyone. I'm Itzel. I am a sociology and communications double major. I'm a third year. I'm involved with the California Aggie, which is the student newspaper on campus, and I'm also the finance executive for Davis Pre-Law Society. And I will pass it on to Scott. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Scott. I am a medieval and early modern studies major. Um, I'm a second year sophomore student, and I am from the Los Angeles area, um, specifically from the South Bay area. And yeah. Mark, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, that's everybody. Thank you. Um, so make sure if you have questions to use the Q&A feature down at the bottom um, to submit your questions. Um, but why don't we start with something about, oh, how remote learning is going. How are your classes going? Actually, more specifically, <clears throat> do you have access to your faculty? Does that look the same? How does that look different? Um, are you making use of office hours? Um, so maybe just two or three of you want to answer that. How about Leanne, do you want to start since you're our resident senior in the room? Sure. So I'm actually part time um, this quarter just because the remote learning wasn't something I was super um, 
a fan of and I'm lucky enough to be able to um, have the opportunity to go part time. But um, I think I haven't really been doing like the office hours, although I know that my teachers are really um, a lot more receptive to like planning online meetings um, where you can have one on one office hours. And my TAs who like for some of my classes, we don't have a discussion have like stepped up and had um, discussions like before our lectures regularly planned and stuff like that. So um, people are being a lot more flexible during this time. And that's been really nice. Um, did anyone else want to say anything? I want to popcorn if you're not. Um, I can speak um, for, I know like uh, for a lot of transfer students, um, especially since like community colleges usually have smaller classes, a concern might be like coming to Davis, like large class sizes and remote learning, it might be a challenge. Um, I'm taking a really huge class of uh, biology, um, intro to biology, and it's like 500 students. But um, there's a lot of TAs, all the professors are super like receptive. Um, if anything, there's a TA always like on call for um, student questions between like the hours of nine to like 5 p.m. every single day of the week. So I think that like, if anything, here at Davis, the professors are really trying to be accommodating. And if some of them aren't accommodating, it's because they're unaware that the students like of student concerns and they're still working on it. So I think if anything, like communication is really key. And so far in my classes, communication has been working and my teachers have been trying to accommodate everyone, be it like Wi-Fi failures or one-on-one -on -one help, things like that. So yeah. Great. Um, so we do have a question about changing majors. Um, I can answer that, but does, does anybody have experience with changing majors? Just want to talk about the process and then I can, I can answer specifically about transfer students. So what does the process look like for changing majors? Do you have to do your prereqs ahead of time? Leanne, you changed majors, right? Yeah, I did. And I'm reading the specifics of this, but I would say off the bat, yes, it is possible as a transfer student to change your majors. Um, as far as how difficult it would be, um, I can't really talk to that specifically because I don't know what courses you've taken um, at your community college, but um, I'd say it's definitely possible. Um, and you can take the prereqs at Davis. So it would just be kind of like any um, other change of major, you would talk to your advisor, um, probably within sociology and have an appointment with the um, biology advisor. But um, it's, they make the process as simple as possible, really. I changed my major twice um, and I never ran into any roadblocks. Um, they just helped me make a quarter plan until like up until I graduated to um, make sure that I was graduating within the time frame that I wanted. So. Um, yes it's possible and um davis makes it um simple relative to other colleges that i've heard of yeah zach as a as a tour guide i know you probably have some stats or, or know some things about how many students change majors do you want to just talk about what what you talk about on your on your tours yeah so there's actually not a statistic that davis has about like how many students really do change their major but it does happen a lot even if students don't necessarily take the action to change their major, most people think about it within their time here, which mm -hmm. is very natural considering that you're trying to get into the field that you potentially want to go into a career in. I know I had filled out the form that you fill out online. It takes like two seconds to fill out online. I know I had filled that out a few times in my, in my years here at Davis and was close to changing my major a few times, but event inevitably, inevitably I didn't. Um, but it is a very easy process and the Davis community does have a lot of resources there that are, that are there to help you in your transition from one major to another. So talking to those advisors, getting to know um, what are the requirements needed to actually make that switch and then also um, trying to make a timeline for it as well too. Great. So we have a couple of questions about remote learning. Will fall quarter be online? If we are online, what about lab classes? So I'll just answer that really quickly. 
Um, we don't know the answer to that just yet. Um, and the reason we don't is because we start later. So you've probably all heard that um, some community colleges, but the entire Cal State system uh, announced that they're gonna be remote in the fall. But most of the UCs, including UC Davis, start a month or so later. And so we actually still have some time to make that decision. So we don't know just yet, um, but most likely some classes will be online. Um, probably a lot of classes will be offered online. Um, but even if we are online, just like the CSUs, the Cal State schools, there will be classes that could be in person, like classes that require lab work. Um, and so we will probably have some sort of hybrid system. Um, so I hope that answered those questions. Um, we, we won't have a definitive answer probably until sometime in June. Okay, um, let's talk about, uh, there was a question about meeting people in clubs and things like that. Um, where did you guys meet people um, in your classes and clubs? Um, Scott, I know you're part of a club. Um, Leanne, I know you do. Um, Priel, I think you're pre-law. You're, yep. So do you guys want to just talk maybe about some of the things you've done to get involved in Build Community? Scott, do you want to start? Um, sure, sure. So I've been involved in um, numerous, so I've been involved in several different clubs such as the um, histor histor such as the Davis Historical Fencing Club. Um, I've also been involved in the Davis um, Writing Fiction Club and um, also the Young Democrats Club. And um, I've met numerous people um, through, 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 those, through, through those clubs, especially through clubs like the Young Democrats Club and um, also for doing um, historical fencing. Um, in fact, like um, one of the, um, in fact, one of the people that I actually met through fencing was, is actually now a housemate of mine. Um, we live in an apartment together now. Um, okay. So that's, that's going really well. Um, okay. And I know we have several other people who were, um, I know we have at least one other person who, who is an ambassador who was on the Young Democrats Club. Yeah. So yeah. Great. Clubs are definitely a very good way to meet new people and to, um, Yeah. Priyo, do you want to talk about um, where you find clubs, like what the resources are for finding those kinds of opportunities? Yeah, so um, before my freshman year, I remember I spent the summer looking on Aggie Life, um, which is basically this whole like, I guess like a database for like all the different organizations that UC Davis has. And you can like uh, search up by categories or you could type in like any uh, names you want. And there's so many clubs based on your interests. And so all I did was I searched up the clubs and like the topics I was more interested in and I um, either sent them an email or like lo um, look them up on Facebook if that like a Facebook page and these clubs often post like when they're going to have their first meetings mm -hmm. um, on their group pages and so if you just follow those um, you can go to the first meetings figure out if you like the club or not and that's what I ended up doing. Um, also in the beginning of freshman year they have a bunch of different fairs and like events um, where all the clubs come out and they have little booths and you can uh, attend those events and see if you're interested in joining the club. Perfect. Great. Um, okay, there's a question about living in on-campus apartments. Um, I'm aware that transfers will be in a new building. In general, what are the pros of campus apartments versus off campus where it might likely be cheaper to live. Um, what have you chosen for your housing and why? So has anybody lived in any of the on-campus apartments like over in West Village or, yes? Okay, Scott, do you wanna talk about West Village? Uh, yeah, so generally what you're looking at with on-campus apartments like West Village is you're looking at a um, good level of quality of living, um, pretty, a very good, very good um, standardized living conditions. And you're typically going to be guaranteed a place yeah. um, for housing. Um, yeah. Generally with them um, living off campus, um, you know, it can be much more varied and of course much more mixed. You can find a wide range of housing prices from, you know, places where the rent is just like 250 a month to some really expensive like places upwards of one, upwards of $1,000 per month. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get some very good quality housing from um, from off from off campus, both in terms of apartments and 
just in terms of living in a townhouse whatsoever, um, you're not necessarily going to be guaranteed to live in that place. So typically when you're, so typically when you're looking at some, trying to find a place to rent or um, buy, you're typically going to be competing with all these different people as well. So um, you're going to have to basically kind of cast your net wide and look at all these different um, apartments and opportunities, basically. Whereas um, if you look at a place like um, West Village, for instance, where I'm living, you can pretty much sign up on a lease. And um, if you do it, if you do it, if you do it by the deadline, and um, if you have everything, and if you do everything correctly, you should be guaranteed a place to live. Um, okay. The uh, difference really is that oftentimes um, some people might worry about the price for um, for 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 um, housing on for ha for housing um, for ca for campus apartments, mm -hmm. but they're not too expensive. Anybody else want to talk about their experience living off campus? I can go ahead um, real quick. Um, off campus, like Scott said, there's a lot of options. So you kind of have to um, go through a lot of different places. Um, and there are a lot of different places to live in Davis. So you kind of have to go in um, thinking like knowing where you want to be um, in relation to campus um, in terms of transportation and um, grocery stores and things like that but um, ultimately I chose to live in an off-campus apartment just because it was cheaper and I found a cheaper option um, and I really like the location I live near Trader Joe's on Sycamore Lane um, but yeah it's cheaper but then again like Scott said the on-campus housing is like standardized where your units are like all going to be the same and going to have um they're going to have like a certain level of quality that they um will abide by but you just kind of have to be scrupulous in looking for um like what apartments to live in because there's a really wide range in davis great um who wants to talk about the safety of campus um priel yes please and then metzley great so I saw that question about if it is it safe to walk after 11 p.m. Yeah. Um, and I can definitely attest to that because I'm part of the UC Davis uh, Ross Lila dance team and our practices are from uh, 9.30 to 11.30 p.m. in the night. And so usually I'm walking on campus like 11.30 or 12 in the night. And I can definitely say it's safe. Like I've never had any strange um, experiences or any anytime I felt in danger. Um, it can be a little dark um, because we don't have a lot of lights but I never felt in any danger or any like had any bad experiences. So I, I, I think it is safe. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, kind of like on both sides of the coins where I've been out on campus like super early and super late. Um, super early because like the rowing team like has practice at like four. Um, and I would bike to all the way across campus to get to practice. And never once did I there was one time that I got scared, but that was because there was a raccoon and I was like, I am not getting attacked by a raccoon because <laughs> I had never seen a raccoon in my life. But never once have I felt unsafe. Also, um, late at night, there's Safe Ride. Safe Ride runs starting at 10 p.m. and it can take you anywhere on, from like UC Davis campus to anywhere throughout the Davis city. So many times when I was studying in the library really late, I just call a safe ride and they literally drive me home. So there's that. Hey Zach, do you want to just mention the blue light? Thank you. So all across the Davis campus, we also have these blue emergency lights that are scattered throughout campus as well too. So if there's ever like an emergency happening, it's just some, like a button you press. And then um, we do have an on-campus police and fire department. And anytime you dial 911 on campus, there is a response time of less than two minutes to get there. So it is completely a separate station from the city one. So we have one that specifically goes in Davis and the Davis Police Department also does hourly patrols across our campus as well too. So they, they get to drive on the cool bike lanes all across campus and just kind of go around campus making sure everything's good. And they do, they do pass by a lot of the on-campus places pretty often as well too. So there's also that added level of security there too. Great. Hey, Itzel, do you want to talk about um, contacting an advisor and what that looks like and your experience with that? Um, in our college, we, 
we call it mandatory advising, uh, but we like to say it's it's a student's opportunity to meet with an advisor at least once a year. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about what that looks like? Yeah, so you have mandatory advising as a student of the College of Letters and Science. However, it's not simply just, I mean, obviously you're gonna be talking about your four-year plan. You're gonna be talking about when you wanna graduate, if you wanna graduate early, if you wanna double major, those kinds of things. But also advisors really want to know if you're doing okay. Um, I had one session, my very first session with my advisor where she asked me, like after we had finished my four-year plan, she asked me, she's like, okay, what are you joining? Like, what are you doing? I know you're far from home and I'd like for you to be involved in something. So it's a great opportunity not to just have your four-year plan and know how your years are gonna go out, but it's a good thing just to just talk to someone who knows what goes on on campus. Does anybody else have experience I want to talk about communicating with their advisors. Maybe even now, has anybody done that during our remote quarter? Yeah. I can say by uh, meeting your like major advisors, there's like an online appointment system um, where you can uh, pick like uh, what college you're in and which advisor you would like to see. And, and then they ask you what you like to discuss, if there's anything special. And it's, um, that's like the easiest way to um, book an appointment and because uh, they're also busy and they have the schedule so sometimes they'll have like the calendar where they're like booked where you're not where they're not available so you pick a time and then you can go in and see them and um, I go to my advisor pretty frequently especially before like we decide our schedules and um, I've never had too much trouble um, too much trouble obtaining an appointment um, unless it's like a super busy time. So I do recommend trying to book an appointment as early as possible because the later you book it, the harder, um, harder time you're gonna have to find a time slot for it. Okay, um, cars. Are cars necessary if you live off campus? How about other transportation options? Biking, skateboarding, busing, walking. Sure, so I can talk about that. Um, the In terms of, do I feel it's necessary to have a car? I don't think so. Um, even if you live off campus um, within Davis, um, we have a really extensive and regular running bus system called Unitrans, uh, and most lines run every half hour. Um, so you're never really gonna um, need a car unless you want to go outside of Davis or live outside of Davis. Um, in terms of the age old like biking walking question on campus, uh, it's really up to personal preference because you can get around by walking just fine. It just takes a little longer, but um, you know, if you really want to have a bike, um, I am a huge advocate for having a bike just because you get around a lot faster. Um, it's, you know, part of the culture, you're getting the real Davis experience, but um, you know, if you feel safer walking or boarding um it's yeah there's you're not missing out on anything nor is it like a hindrance to um getting around davis yeah it's out um there's also like an unknown perk to walking there's this thing on facebook you can just search it up it's called uc davis rocks and i think it's like five people who will paint rocks and hide them around campus and you can only find them if you're walking so there's a small prick. I love that. Um, oh, how about the difficulty of getting classes? So particularly when you're looking at upper division, um, let's see, so uh, who wants to take that? Anybody have experience trying to get into upper division classes? Yeah, so I can do a quick comment on that just because okay. I've had exactly. problems if the class is, sorry, Zach, if the class is cross-listed for a bunch of different majors, it's really um, can be difficult sometimes because I had a um, computational linguistics class that was cross-listed for computer science and all of the computer science uh, majors were trying to get in it. Um, and I think to a certain degree, um, sometimes it just requires persistence, like waitlisting and going to the class and seeing if anyone drops. Um, but sometimes, you know, if it's a really popular class and um, 
you just can't get in, they will very often just offer it in the next quarter if it's popular enough. Yeah, and to kind of add on to that, um, in general, like how the registration process works is that there's like a pass one, an open registration period, pass two, open registration, and then classes will start. Um, so generally during the pass one time, there are a lot of main, there are a lot of classes that may, especially if they are upper division, maybe like closed off to only the people that are technically registered within that major. Um, so generally the first time around when people register for classes, a lot of the times it's the one that you're already registered with. Um, for instance, I'm a political science minor. Um, sometimes the political science classes I can't directly get right away just because they're set aside for the majors and a lot of the different departments that may need them. Uh, but what's great is that there is like open registration and pass too, which allows people to either add on to classes that the restrictions are no longer holding anymore um, or if they want to wait list for it as well too. Um, I haven't really had too much difficulty in getting classes. Um, most of the time, even if I had waitlisted, I normally got on, which is really nice because within those first two weeks of the quarter, that's when most people typically maybe sign up for a lot of classes or sign up for a class they think they'll like, try it out for a little bit and then be like, okay, maybe this isn't the class for me. And then as people start to drop, the people that are on the waitlist tend to get up. So um, it's generally not a too difficult process to getting classes. I know I haven't had um, any issues as well, but I know there are some students who may have it a little bit more difficulty than I have. Okay, so um, there is a question about changing majors affecting financial aid, and the answer is no. Financial aid is tied to a full-time budget, um, which doesn't depend on your major. There might be additional cost for like lab fees or material fees that could be part of your financial aid package, but that would be probably pretty small, um, all things considered. So um, we do have another question about first year seminars. Did anybody take first year seminars and, and have any that they liked or enjoyed itself? What did you, what class did you take? Um, my first year seminar really wasn't that serious. It was like a Disney first year seminar. Yep. And so we just watched a bunch of Disney movies and then analyzed like, um, the different factors that they played within their time so like sexism feminism stuff like that um i had a roommate who took a simpsons first year seminar so there's a lot of fun ones and then there's also some serious ones like i know there's some that like have to do with physics some that have to do with engineering it just really is based on like what you kind of want to do and if you just want to like have some fun for like a one unit course mm -hmm. Uh, could I also say something? Um, of course. Yeah. I took one of the more like serious ones, I guess. Um, my first year seminar was like microbio. Um, the reason why like I'm bringing this up though is because um, some of you like are really looking for research opportunities. So I'd recommend maybe like a little more on the shyer side and don't feel comfortable like with um, point blank approaching some random professor and saying like, hey, can I work in your lab for research? Mm -hmm. um, there's some first year seminars that are research seminars. So um, for mine, my microbio one, we were researching spider venom. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't much we could do because um, this was during like some like great fires happening up north. And so classes were canceled around Thanksgiving. But um, my professor, he showed us how to use like um, some like software that microbiologists use to analyze data and we were um he even like offered he told us like if any of you guys ever need a research opportunity send me an email and you're in and i was like this guy is so nice but um if you guys are interested in research maybe like look into first year seminars mm -hmm. or unless you already have something in mind then by all means <laughs> okay um Let's see. Um, I don't. I don't think any of you are transfer students, right? Any of the ambassadors on the call? No. Um, so there is a question about double majoring. Um, so double majoring, depending on how much you bring with you from community college pre prerequisite work, could mean another year or maybe another quarter. 
Um, it really just depends on, on how much you bring with you. Um, switching from a non-science to a science major, um, again, it really depends on what you've taken already, um, if you're switching, but also if you're double majoring and what, you're double ma what you plan to double major in. Um, some majors are pretty small unit wise, and so they don't require a lot of classes um, or prerequisites. So it's possible to squeeze them into to two years. Mm, okay, what is, the stu what is transfer living like? Um, do you recommend transfer student housing? So um, Scott, I know you talked a little bit about living out at West Village. It's not called West Village anymore. There's a new name. I can't think of what it's called. Um, as that, do you know that, Scott, or Zach? Soul at West Village now. <laughs> Soul, Soul at West Village. Yeah. Um, so I think, do you want to talk about um, maybe on campus versus off campus in terms of transfer housing options? Yeah, so as a transfer student, I believe you have six different options to choose from in terms of like what type of housing you want to have. Um, and they do vary. There is one on camp directly on campus apartment called Primero Grove Apartments. Mm -hmm. And that one is actually right on campus, actually right next to a like a freshman living um, area as well, too. So mm -hmm. there, what's great about that one is that you're directly on campus. So it's very convenient in terms of like going straight to classes or anything like that as well. Um, as a transfer student, you also have an option to have a meal plan if you do want to choose so as well too. Um, and the dining commons where those are eligible for are in the living areas for freshman students. So if you're on campus and right next to one, then you do have a little bit easier access to get one. Um, and then besides that, there's also the Soul at West Village um, that they also have, which is which is like on campus, but I know they're not technically affiliated with Davis, even though they kind of are at the same time. It's a weird caveat, uh, but that does also have similar benefits. I did also live there my second year. So um, I know that it's super easy to like, just wake up right before class and just go bike right onto campus as well too, which is really nice. Um, and then I know Davis does also own a few apartment complexes off campus as well too. Uh, which can range anywhere from like half a mile to four miles off campus. So um, it depends on really what you're looking for in terms of an experience. If you are looking for a little bit more of the convenience of staying on campus, being close to a lot more different things, um, then maybe the on, maybe the on campus opportunities may be a little bit better. Um, however, if you're looking for, to get a little bit space from like the university in terms of like where you want to live, maybe you want to like be able to like take a little breath away and go home kind of thing. Um, totally understandable. I get it. I live two miles from campus right now. So um, it's definitely really what you're depending on. There's always pros and, be pros and cons to either living situation um, just because of all the different factors to take into account, but really just kind of depending on what you're trying to look for to take out of that living experience as well too. Okay, there's another question about biking. And Zach, you actually said biking from um, West or Seoul. Um, uh, is it necessary to ride a bike? What are some of the other transportation options? I know we, we talked a little bit about buses and stuff, but uh, maybe, maybe from, maybe not so much from getting to campus, but once you're on campus, if you're getting around, what are some of those options that you all have used other than a bike. Anybody? Does anybody walk? I walk. Okay. Um, for transportation wise, I live off campus. Um, I live in these apartments called Tanglewood and it's really nice because um, the Arboretum Trail actually starts like right behind my apartment. So I just take a walk through the Arboretum to my classes, which is nice because it's scenic with like ducks <laughs> and the um, Puda Creek. But honestly, I feel like, I think somebody brought this up. It's really just preference. Um, for me, mm -hmm. at least, it takes the same amount of time to walk and bus. Um, I used to bike, but personally, I like walking just because I feel like um, when I biked, my life was a lot more fast paced and I like, you know, taking a breather and it's kind of like 
I guess, meditation. I'm not really meditating, but it's kind of like just to relax and, you know, take in like the scenery before like, you know, focusing in my classes and things like that. Yeah, great. Um, has anybody made use of the internship and career center either to find internships or jobs on campus? Zach, you have. Speak to that. So I've, I've been to the ICC quite a bit. Um, they've helped me with a lot, actually. When I was a first year student on campus, I know I was very worried about adjusting to like getting the professional development kind of stuff, like working and going. So I know I went to, they do hold a lot of great workshops there to like understand a lot of the things that you're going to have to go through. There's like, they can do, they have like prep workshops for like upcoming career internship fairs. So if you want to meet someone, how do you talk to them kind of thing? Because I went to my first career fair with very little prep and it was a, quite a little bit of a mess. Um, but after I went to the workshops and got a little bit more knowledge about it and I went back, it was so much better. Um, I also found uh, one of my internships, well, an internship that I had for actually this quarter spring, but unfortunately had to go on pause due to the current situation, I actually found through the ICC because they provide emails and do a lot of listservs and provide students with opportunities of like any internships or jobs that are happening within the area. And they also do help by breaking it up by area. So there could be like business and development ones, um, physical sciences and engineering. So they do have like catered listservs to particular areas, which is really nice. Um, and then I also had interviewed, because there are some companies that work with the ICC to actually hold on-campus interviews for positions, which are really nice. Um, and I got to go through that experience last quarter as well too, when I was um, interviewing for a particular company. Um, so all the interviews were on campus and they had like catered everything to it, which was really nice. So overall, it is a really great resource in terms of like anything professional development related. Um, it could be as simple as just working on a resume or how to write a cover letter. They do and they do it all. So it is a really helpful resource um, to connect with if you're particularly looking to maybe gain that internship experience within your time at Davis or if you're about to graduate and you're looking for a job, they're also there to help for those as well, too. Great. Um, so we have some questions about financial aid. Um, do you know how soon you will receive, uh, sorry, it jumped. Um, do we know how soon you will receive financial aid money if you're living off campus um, for moving into an apartment at the beginning of September? So. Um, does anybody want to talk about like when financial aid disperses, if you have experience with that? And if not, I can answer it. Okay, so um, in general, um, it really doesn't matter if you're on or off campus, um, a freshman or a transfer student, financial aid disperses. Oh, it's, I think it's about a week before classes actually start, before the beginning of the quarter. So it financial aid will not disperse until close to the end of September um, or maybe the mid mid to late September. Um, but I know that financial aid does offer emergency loans, so that might be an option. Um, but I would definitely contact the financial aid office if you needed sort of like a, like a step grant or a step loan to get you through to be able to make that first housing um, payment. Okay. Mm, what about work study job? Does anybody have a work study job on campus? No. So work study is also a financial aid um, grant. Um, well, it's a financial aid award. Um, a lot of jobs on campus are offered through work study. Um, but finding a work study job is the same as finding a regular job on campus. You do it through the internship or career center using the Handshake uh, tool, Handshake. I think it's just handshake.ucdavis.edu or something like that. Um, so that's the, that's the place where you would look for jobs. And if it is a work study job, it will be indicated as a, as a work study job. If you were not offered work study, but you do have a financial aid package, it's possible to ask the financial aid office for um, to see if you qualify for a work study award. Mm, 
Okay, what else is in here? Has anybody ever gone to or needed to use the Student Health Center? <laughs> I know Zach has. <laughs> Do you want to talk about your experience and where it is and stuff? Yeah, so I actually had badly sprained my ankle last quarter and I hurt it real bad playing tennis at Tennis Club. Um, if you love tennis, it's a great club to join. Um, but <laughs> I was playing tennis and I was playing a little bit too hard and I rolled my ankle really nastily and I had to go um, to get it looked at because I had waited overnight just so that it would like maybe it like be better but I woke up and it was extremely painful and it was not pretty so um, I went to the student health and wellness center which is um, it's on campus and it's really close to campus as well too which is really nice um, and they did x-rays, they looked at it, they were very nice. Um, and they gave me everything that I needed to like, like mobilize <laughs> around everywhere. So um, gave me crutches, gave me a boot, gave me all everything that I needed. And then they also gave me, which was really cool. If you ever get injured, this is a really good thing. They have something called the mobility assistance shuttle. So if you ever like, like sprain your ankle like me, and then you're worried about like, going around campus or whatever as well too. There's actually golf carts that they have that mm -hmm. are specifically set for people who have injuries or have issues mobilizing around campus. So I got to ride that for like a good month or so, which was, which was awesome because I knew I could go to campus and still like be around campus and do mm -hmm. all my normal things, but I just didn't have to worry about like crutching over from building to building, which is really nice. So they were really helpful staff. You can go with them for anything if you're feeling sick, if you need anyone to talk to. Also, if you have like any of those, like, like I had like an injury that needed to be addressed, um, it's a really great place to kind of go. Um, so the other part of that question was about weekends. I don't think the Student Health Center is open on the weekends, but they do offer um, um, like a uh, advice nurse um like a triage advice nurse line so there's a phone line for that and then i think students are probably referred up to sutter davis which is a hospital in town um for emergency over the weekend and then and then there are also um uh, what do you call them like strip mall kind of <laughs> what are those what are those called do you know what i mean uh like emergency clinics kind of thing yeah um okay so oh i don't know about transfer edge zach do you know have you heard of transfer edge through admissions or through tours no has anybody heard of transfer edge i don't know the answer to that i'm sorry um okay let's see what else we have in here Oh, here's a question. Can you fit all of your classes into two days a week? Who wants to talk about that? Zach or Scott, do you want to, do you, you said yes. Scott, what do you, what's, what's been your experience with that? Well, um, I myself, I will just, I'll, I'm just, I'm just going to say, I myself have not fit two classes, classes into just two days, though I do know people who have. And um, I do know people who have taken um, a four o'clock, Four classes like them um, and have managed to actually put them into two two day blocks for, for their schedule so okay. it can work I have fit classes into three days and that's the most I can do be just because it also just depends on your major and they have like the different days spread out for you but your best bet is probably just having Friday off yeah, um, for next quarter, I was able to fit my classes into two days, but then I looked at how much, how many hours of class I would have in those two days, and mm, the idea of possibly having midterms all on the same day was horrifying, so <laughs> I changed my schedule. <laughs> and then, like, I, lastly, I had a concept. It's the preference on like what type of schedule you want. Um, I know like for my majors, most of the classes have to be broken up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because that's 
what like the department does. Um, I've ha I have done like schedules where I have like back to back to back to back classes. Um, that's just how I like it because I really like being like super productive in a block and then having enough time to like do whatever the next day. So it is nice having days off when you don't have class because that gives you a chance to kind of catch up and maybe do stuff. And then like, I like to fill it up with work as well. Um, but it is um, a preference about whether or not you wanna have that as well. If you are trying to fit it in two days, I would recommend trying to give yourself a block of break in between uh, like all your classes within those days, just because I know it can be very overwhelming to maybe like go like four classes straight in a row from like 9 a.m. to three or whatever. So I know that's like how we used to do it in like high school and stuff, but uh, sometimes sometimes you need that break. So it's good to give yourself a break when you can, but yeah. Um, I'll just quickly talk about Transfer Edge since now I know what it is. Um, it sounds like it's kind of a like a transition program for students um, to, to UC Davis to the, a research institution, um, a quarter system. So I guess my short answer to whether or not someone would want to participate in the Transfer Edge program would be, um, you know, if, if, um, if you need to find out about what resources are, are available to you and getting acclimated to the campus and learning about what a 10 week quarter system is like, um, the, those kinds of things. That's what that's what Transfer Edge is all about. Um, so it's it's probably for students who who may need a little extra help um, transitioning. I hope that I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, oh my goodness! Why does nobody wear a camp on campus wear a helmet? Do you all wear helmets when you bike on campus? No. Um, no. That's. Uh, I you I feel like you're asking that question to see if there's like some sort of like unspoken rule about not wearing a helmet. And there is not. Um, it's definitely don't feel peer pressured to not wear a helmet because you should. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't I don't know the reason why the reason why I don't um, I have a large head and it's hard to find a helmet, but that's just kind of an excuse for um, not taking my health seriously enough. Yeah, <laughs> but no, yeah, not a lot of people do, but there are ways to um, get a free helmet um, on campus. Um, it's, oh, I wish I knew what it was called. There's a pledge that you can sign, um, but I think it's called Buy Care, Don't Care. Um, yep. where you can sign a pledge and then they'll give you a free helmet um, because no excuse is good enough to not wear a helmet. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, so where, when can I look for Handshake? When, uh, so if you qualify for work study and you want to do work study, um, when, can you, when can you look for Handshake? Does anybody have any experience with Handshake? I think we already talked about this, but. I think you can start looking into Handshake once you've officially created your UC Davis Kerberos login information. So essentially like your username and password for everything UC Davis school related. And once you do that, um, there's like, if you look on Handshake UC Davis, there's a link and you can log in using that information you've created mm -hmm. and you can begin looking into um, potential jobs you want to apply for. Great. Um, oh, okay. So we answered a question. Perfect. Um, does anybody, has anybody um, or used or has anyone known anyone who's used the Student Disability Center for resources? We talked a little bit about mobility um, if, you're, if you're injured, um, but does anybody use the Student Disability Center or know someone Leanne yeah yeah so um for the disabilities accommodations what you can do um is on campus at the MU if you're on campus there's um within the MU there's a building that is the student um disabilities accommodations and you can just do a little walk-in where they'll um you'll kind of say I want to make an appointment um, because we have like um, specialists 
who can listen to what your concerns are and um, make accommodations from there. Um, but basically, the what the process is generally um, is they'll give you a form um, and you just fill it out and then you have to send it into your doctor um, and your doctor will fill it out with um, what accommodations they suggest or um, like what your um, certain um, like differently abled um, yeah I guess what, what um, accommodations like yeah. you could need or like how it affects you. Um, mm -hmm. And then you basically just take it in um, with the doctors and they will um, accommodate you in that way. I know um, speaking from personal experience and people that I also know, you can get um, extra time on exams where you take it in like a different room with your TA. Um, you can also get um, people who will write your notes for you, like, or not for you, but there's like note takers. So mm -hmm. um, someone in your classes can um, like volunteer to take notes and then you get those notes. Um, and those are like the specific like school related ones that I know, but they try and make the accommodations um, as easy as possible to get. Um, it just really, for me at least, it really um, depended on how responsive my um, insurance and doctors were with it. Perfect. Okay. Um, yes. Less mobility, more extra time on exams. Exactly. Yep. All of those things. So there are accommodations for that. There's transportation around campus, extra time extra resources, different modalities, all those kinds of resources, just like Leanne was saying. Um, okay, so we have a question about work study. Um, if you weren't offered work study, then you probably do need to contact the financial aid office directly um, using their Ask an Advisor um, resource link if it wasn't part of your original financial aid package. So I would contact the the financial aid office. If you were only if you only received the middle class scholarship and loans, it's probable that you didn't qualify for work study since it's it's a need based award, um, but it really depends on how much financial need um, you have based on your expected family contribution and the FAFSA and all of that. Mm, okay, um, does anybody use the university the student health? Or do you use your parents? The student health um, insurance, the SHIP plan? No? Nobody uses SHIP? Okay. So there's a question about whether or not you use the university's health um, or if you requested a waiver. So um, nobody uses SHIP, right? Oh, you do? Oh, Zach? Yeah? Yeah, there is a, yeah. This year there was something different that happened, so I had to use the ship one, which which was good because of what happened with my like and everything. But uh, yeah, they are very helpful. Okay, Matt Splay, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, I actually. So my parents were kind of paranoid, and so I had like both my parents' insurance and as well as ship. <laughs> um, so this was like my freshman year, though. Um, ship is really convenient, partially because it's like the UC Davis Student Health Center is like right on campus. Um, my parents have Kaiser insurance, which now is more convenient because there's a clinic right across from my apartments. <laughs> but um, really it's based on like, you know, if you're financially capable of paying for SHIP, because although it is kind of pricey because they do like provide a lot of care that you're able to get, um, you can like drop in for like emergency appointments or like um, it's easily accessible, mm -hmm. um, or um, you can also just have your insurance that you already have from your parents if that's more convenient for you and your family. Yeah, and so if you are covered under your your family's insurance plan, which I think you can be until you're 26 or something, um, you just do the waiver, um, and all you do is just show that you you're already covered. That's all. That's all we 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 just want to make sure that you're covered um, under some sort of healthcare plan. So if you are covered by your parents, then you just get that waiver form. Mm, okay. Uh, does it sound doable for a computer science major? 
to take other classes, such as music? Are there music and computing related sources on campus? Um, so I know, Leanne, you've been involved in music. Has anyone else been involved in music? I know none of you are music majors, but can you take music classes if you're not a major? Yeah. Um, I'm a physics major. <laughs> um, I take something, I mean, I grew up with music, so although I'm not a music major, and although it would be interesting to be one, I'm not. Um, but I do take music classes every quarter. Um, for those of you concerned about like, well, I'm a computer science major or physics or STEM major, and you know, I'm taking a lot of courses, do I have time? Um, a lot of classes, pretty much all you have to do is show up. And you receive, I mean, you probably already completed your GEs, but you receive credit if you want, or you can just do a no credit and just show up for participation. Um, most of the music classes are no experience necessary, or if you do have experience, it's like a great time to work with someone who's dedicated their life to studying music and like, you know, learn more skills. So highly recommend for anybody interested. Completely doable. Yeah. Totally. And also, if you are a musician, um, there are a bunch of different ensembles that you can be in. So I'm a part of concert band, but there's also an orchestra as well as jazz bands. Um, I think we have a Hindustani um, voice ensemble. Um, if you're more into choir, we also have um, chamber music um, ensembles. So if you're used to working in small groups, um, and that's for the musician part. But um, in terms of music and computing related sources on campus. I don't know if you mean um, the intersection of the two. However, I do know of a professor in the linguistics department um, that's doing research with um, like cognition and music um, and things like that. So um, if you're interested in that, um, you can definitely check that out. Um, but I would say if you look hard enough, there are, um, always going to be intersections of um, related fields um, at Davis. Yeah, um, and kind of quickly adding on to that, there's one person I know who was like electrical engineering major, but he was he was also working with his advisor to do like some like electrical engineering music major because he wanted to go into like theater production or something like that. So whatever you want to do, you just got to talk to the right people and make it happen, I guess. <laughs> So I'm just, I'm just typing in a resource here for that question. Um, cinema and digital media is a great major um, that includes um, production, um, audio production. Um, so there might be some intersection there. I would also suggest looking at design too. Um, and maybe even, I'm just gonna go out on a limb, science and technology studies. That might be a place where you could see the intersection of humanities, arts, and science and technology. So um, hopefully that is helpful. Um, does anybody have minors? Anybody have a planning a minor? Zach? Priel, you're, you're, you're doing a minor? Do you want to talk about what it means to declare a minor and, and how you prepare for getting a minor? Yeah, so I'm doing a sociology minor, um, and all you have to do is, um, I think each minor has like a required number of courses that you have to take to declare that minor. So for sociology, I have to take five operative uh, sociology courses. And so once I've taken those, I can declare a minor with my advisor. Perfect. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Very simple. And and actually with, with declaring of minors, you don't even need to do it until I think the quarter you graduate, the quarter before you graduate, I think. Um, yeah, it's very simple to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are at two o'clock. Why don't we just take one more question? Let me scroll through here and see what we've got. Does anybody see anything that they want to answer? We have a raised hand. Oh, we do. Yes. Um, okay, let's see how this works. Do you want to ask your question? Um, yes, I wanted to ask about, hey, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about any suggestions for English literature majors for UC Davis. I'm a transfer student um, for fall. What kind of, um, like, what do you mean by suggestions? 
Um, any like uh, work study jobs for English literature uh, majors? Got it. Jobs for work study or for English. Um, if you mean specifically for like someone wanting to get experience, um, hmm, that's a good question. I mean, certainly if you're if you're interested, Metzli, did you want um, to? I was just gonna say. I was kind of interested in this because I was helping my friend. She's an art history major, um, but for literature, I'm not exactly sure if you're looking for something like writing related or, um, you know, like actually like researching like historical literature. There is some jobs offered by the library that are really cool where um, you look into special collections and help with the preservation of like historical texts that we have on campus. Um, there's also, I think Scott, um, works in like the writing center and you can help students if you're interested in the writing aspects. Um, you can help students like with their own like writing and things like that. Um, really, to be honest, I have no experience in like literature, but um, I would definitely check out like maybe things Shields Library or other libraries offer or looking in your department website because they definitely might have resources. Thank you. Yeah. All right, folks, um, we are officially out of time. I just want to remind everyone who is joining us today that we are recording this. So we will post the recording on our website. If you go to the college website, um, lettersandscience.ucdavis.edu and just go to the Aggie Experience page, you'll see the recordings there. Um, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists, our awesome ambassadors for participating today and, and answering all these questions. Thank you for joining us. Congratulations on your admission. Um, come back in a week or so. I think maybe it's in a week and a half. Um, we're doing a similar session, but with staff and peer advisors. So the academic advising team in the college. So if you have more specific questions about your major or majors or declaring majors or changing majors or anything like that, feel free to come back to that session. It's called Ask an Advisor Anything. Okay? All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.